Episode 6 with best selling author Sam Walker. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Barn Raisers, the number one podcast for teams. Thanks for sharing with your friends. Thanks for the support online through social media. And thanks for taking the time to give us a review on iTunes. A couple more have made their way onto the Barn Raisers page this week, and for that, I am very grateful. Of course, if you've done any of these things before, then you've been barn raising with us already, and you know what goes on here. If you're new, then welcome. We're so happy you could make it. So what does go on here? The way we like to explain it is that Barn Raisers is the place to come and listen to conversations with the world's ultimate team players. That's right, each fortnight we talk to some of the most inspirational, accomplished and respected team players from all over the world and from all walks of life. And we do all this so you can hear the stories, insights, experiences and challenges that help create some of the most accomplished teams on the planet. We've got a great episode today, so I'm not going to hold you up. Let's get going. The show starts now. The secret to winning is not what you think it is. It's not the coach. It's not the star. It's not chemistry. It's not a strategy. Turns out, it's something else entirely. Several years ago, our guest today, Mr. Sam Walker, set out to answer one of the most hotly debated questions in sports. What are the greatest teams of all time? He devised a formula, then applied it to thousands of teams from leagues all over the world, from the NFL to the English Premier League to Olympic field hockey. When he was done, he had a list of the 16 most dominant teams ever. At that point, he became obsessed with another, more complicated question. What did these freak teams have in common? As Sam dug more deeply, a pattern emerged. Each team had the same type of captain, a singular leader who drove it to sustained, historic periods of greatness. Fueled by a lifetime of sports spectating, 20 years of reporting, and a decade of painstaking research. That's right, a decade. Sam's book, The Captain Class, tells the surprising story of what makes teams exceptional. Drawing on original interviews with athletes from two dozen countries, as well as general managers, coaches, executives, and others skilled at building teams, Sam identified seven core qualities of this captain class. From doggedness and the knack of nonverbal communication, to aggression and the courage to speak truth to power. Told through riveting accounts of some of the most precious soaked moments in sports history, from Bill Russell's legendary Coleman play in the 1957 NBA Finals, to Barcelona's Figo game against Real Madrid in 2000, the captain class doesn't just bring these events to life. It presents a fresh, counterintuitive take on leadership and teams that can be applied to almost any aspect of life from sports to business and even families and communities. To give you a little insight, the 16 leaders who make up the captain class were never the most skilled, nor did they display the best sportsmanship. They were often role players. They disliked the spotlight and were famously inarticulate. In short, they challenged assumptions about what inspired leadership actually looks like. In this episode, we get to sit down with Sam and take a look beyond the names and the glory and take a look at what's really going on here. The book is a fantastic read, and I'd recommend it for anyone with even a passing interest in sports, teams, or statistics even. And if you're in business, then you'll definitely want to hear what Sam has discovered. So let's dive in and find out a little more about some of the most successful sporting teams in history and the types of people that were absolutely critical to helping them get there. So here he is, Mr. Sam Walker, author of The Captain Class, the hidden force that creates the world's greatest team. So 
So, um, so let me ask you, are you the biggest sports fan on the planet, do you think? <laughs> I don't think so. I mean, I know people who are so passionate and, and just can't get enough and live and die for their teams. And I've never really been that way. I think I'm the biggest glutton for punishment, though, <laughs> uh, for sure. I mean, I... I'm really curious about sports. I mean, I, it's funny. I, I was never a great athlete, and, and it wasn't something I imagined that I would do, be a sports writer. But, um, you know, the, I was just so curious about about it. And it's so much fun to explore and to write about um, that I think, the cur- I think learning about things like this, things about like teams and strategy and, um, you know, all the competitive aspects of sports, I think that keeps me going because I think there's just a – endless variety of um, ideas that you can sink your teeth into. So it's really, I think I'm, I may be one of the more curious sports fans roaming the planet, but um, I, I got to tip my hat to the people that really, really live and die for their teams because I just don't have that gene. For sure. I like to think of it as like it's the ultimate in sort of the, all this reality TV. I think watching live sports and things like that, it's the ultimate sort of reality TV for me. I, I mean, <laughs> it's, it's awesome. So what sort of, um, I mean, the book's only just come out. Um, the captain's class and we'll get right into that in a moment but um how much like when did the research for this book start i mean how how far back did it go and how much sort of spade work as you call it in the book did you actually have to do to get to this point it's really almost embarrassing for me to to admit how much work i did i i I have a a tendency to just pour into a subject and and just keep going and going and going and so I, i got the idea for this it wasn't a book at first it was a column in the wall street journal i thought i would write and it started in 2004 that's when i got the idea and the following year i started to um to do what i thought was a simple column i blocked out a few weeks and i thought okay i'm gonna identify the best teams in sports history and I'm going to sort of look at what they have in common. Maybe there's some DNA they share. Maybe there's some secret about, you know, what, what helps a team, what sparks a team to become great. And, you know, I started that. And the first thing I did, of course, was, you know, I Googled greatest teams of all time. And, you know, I looked at every list that had ever been compiled and I realized right away that um, they were very parochial. I mean, they, they were really dependent on where the person was. And there wasn't a lot of methodology at all. And so that's when I started to realize I was in for a real um, bumpy ride. And, you know, I I ultimately realized the only way to do this uh, empirically and objectively was to um, to look at every single winning team in the history of sports in 37 different categories of sports all over the world since the 1880s. And, you know, I set off on that and it just swallowed my life. I mean, it took years just to kind of get a handle on um, on exactly uh, what teams to identify, what teams to include and what teams to study. And then uh, it took almost that long to come up with a methodology for how to do it. So, you know, years of that. And then once I had finished that process, then I got into the real meat of the book, which was what do these teams have in common? And you know, so I really had to profile 16, the 16 teams. And I mean, I could have written a book about every single one of them. And, uh, and then, you know, I, I stumbled into these captains and, uh, then it was another challenge that took a long time to figure out what they had in common and what was similar about them. And, and then the last most brutal part of this fade work was that I had to really dig into science and understand Um, behavioral psychology to understand uh, how these characteristics might help a team. And so, you know, there were really, there were seven qualities that I found these captains shared. And, you know, so I really had to do, you know, it's not quite the same, but it it was close to seven doctoral dissertations, (laughs) you know, about, about behavior and, and psychology to figure out just kind of what science knew about this. And, and how it might help me explain why these characteristics were important. So, um, 11 years in total. Wow. And, uh, you know, I, I took a leave from the paper for about eight months to do a lot of the heavy traveling and interviewing, but, yep. you know, I had to squeeze it in around my job too. So it wasn't 11 solid years of nothing else, but, um, it, it just went on and on. I mean, I can't even, that's, that's... I can't even tell. 
that's what I call going down the rabbit hole. Once you yes. once you ask that question, that's, that's right. you're into it. <laughs> I came out in China, I think. Yeah, <laughs> all the way through, I'm all the way through the core of the earth. <laughs> Fantastic. And I was as I was reading it, I thought you've what you've studied all of these teams, and it's not just the sixteen that you picked out. You you studied them from thousands to begin with. You you took in basically everything. Was there any archival footage that you came across or that you, you looked at that sort of people had forgotten about that was rare or, or, or something that surprised you in that regard? Yeah, no, there were a lot of kind of eureka moments. You know, I spent so much time tracking down information about these teams, especially the ones that, you know, were played long ago. And, um, you know, I, I had to, I had seven or eight translators, um, working with me and for various, uh, teams in different countries. And, you know, was able to get a hold of some really incredible stuff that I, I just is not on YouTube, is not, um, you know, in, in the uh, kind of even in the Western world. And it was it was terrific. I mean, a couple of things that really stood out to me. Um, I, uh, you know, one of the teams that I didn't know anything about and had never really heard of was this Cuban women's volleyball team from uh, from the uh, 90s. And yeah. They are the greatest Olympic team of all time. They basically won every tournament for 10 years and from this tiny, impoverished country. And, um, you know, I was able to get a hold of some footage of their matches uh, through various sources. And some of it actually, when I was in Cuba, I tracked down and um, watching them play was a revelation. I mean, I'd never seen anything like it. There's some of them, uh, uh, their matches are on YouTube, but um, the, the, some of the stuff that I saw that, that was shot you know, from court level, it was yep. really incredible. Another uh, great revelation in the middle of this uh, book was uh, Super Bowl one. Uh, the first Super Bowl was uh, played back when the TV networks in the U.S. didn't record these events. Right. Uh, they just taped over the tape and and they didn't uh, keep <laughs> it. So everyone thought there was never any footage. There was you know, only about thirty seconds of total footage that had been preserved and. You know, a few years ago, one of my reporters at the journal um, stumbled in this amazing story. And this guy had uh, worked at a, one of the local CBS affiliates and had taped the game uh, and, uh, you know, put it on a reel and forgotten about it and left in his attic. And he had passed away and his son found it and realized it was actual footage of Super Bowl one. And oh, wow. um, I didn't wind up inclu including the Green Bay Packers in the in the top 16, but they were definitely a tier two team. And I wrote a lot about Vince Lombardi and that team in the book hmm. and, uh, getting to see that footage was really amazing because I just didn't understand, uh, what a great defensive team the Packers were. I always thought of them as, um, Vince Lombardi was an offensive mastermind and I always thought that that was their strength, but watching that Super Bowl and seeing that swarming defense, I just really got a different sense of, of where that team's power came from. So right. that was just terrific. And, um, you know, there were other things I, I you know, I, I, there's a great book about St. George, uh, the, the great Australian, uh, rugby league team that yep. won, I think, you know, won 11 straight titles, which was fantastic. They didn't make tier one for reasons I'm happy to <laughs> explain, but, um, <laughs> but there's a great book and, and that book was tremendous. And I, yeah, I, I had to pay an arm and a leg to get it cause it doesn't exist in the U S and it had to be sent over from, um, from Australia, but but that was just great reading and really um, enlightening. So there were a lot of moments along the way like that where I got a hold of some obscure text or got uh, an interview. Uh, I did some interviews with the Russian, um, uh, the Soviet Union hockey team and mm -hmm. had a translator working with me and uncovered some stories that had never really been told. And those moments were just priceless. And that's what kept me going, I think, was discovering things that um, – you know, were very hard to find and I hadn't known. Yeah. Just, it's like digging for gold in that sense. Yeah. Just, you're looking really for that is. next nugget of what, what is this going to, what's, what's around the next corner. So, and as we said, you started off the book. I mean, the first question you ask really when you, when you've got a, a table full, I imagine of teams is what exactly is a team? Um, it, it's, it's something that I don't think gets a lot of time is this idea about, well, how do we actually think about what a team is? We've all got a conceived notion, but what is it? And and in your eyes in particular, how do you, what, how do you view what a team actually is? Yeah, I'm really glad you brought that up because it was something I'd never considered. And when I started looking at all the different kinds of sports teams, um, I realized that there's no definition. And, you know, we, a lot of people will say some of these lists had, uh, 
that I saw about of great teams had things like ice dancing mm. and, um, you know, Olympic boxing teams and, you know, and rowing teams. I just, you know, I, I wasn't sure. How do you define that? Is it, is an ice dancing pair? Is that a team? So uh, I finally – I did a lot of work on this and really had to, um, to puzzle it through. And, and I finally realized there are really three things that are required to, to have an actual team in the fullest sense of the word. And the first one was that the athletes have to interact during competition. There has to be teamwork, right? I mean that's the fundamental – Thing that happens. So, yeah. you know, in an Olympic boxing team, for example, I mean, everyone competes separately. So there's no actual interaction between the teammates. And so, you know, all those sports that um, are like that, the Ryder Cup is another example. Um, you in know, golf, uh, yes. I, yeah, no, I just, those, there's no, they all play, but, and they play next to each other, but they don't interact. So I eliminated those teams. And then I realized there was a second uh, dimension to it, which is that the team needs to interact with another team. They have to interact in real time and have to um, make adjustments based on what other people are doing. So, you know, there were teams like uh, rowing teams, uh, which are track relays, teams like that, where the race is really against the clock and, and what an opponent does might, you know, affect your level of effort, but you don't have to react to their moves. So mm-hmm. I eliminated all those teams. And there were a lot of teams that fit those categories. But the third thing and, and the final thing that um, I think defines a team is that it has to be pretty big. I mean, you can't have, uh, you know, there's no definition of how many people are required to make a team. If it's animals, a team can be two horses. Or, right, but there's, right. no, there's no definition for humans. And I, I felt, you know, when you have two people, there's two problems. One, it's really a partnership. And I think that's a different dynamic. And secondly, you know, one person's effort, um, would it, should it be great or terrible is very likely to, um, to affect the outcome or to, to determine the outcome. So in the end, I decided that, uh, the smallest the unit could be would be five, uh, members. And I feel like that in theory, everyone contributes about 20% of the, um, activity toward the total. And, and I thought that was a fair place to start. So I eliminated any teams that were um, consisted of fewer than five members. So once I'd done that, I'd, I'd narrow the list down to, I think, 36 sports that, that meet all of those definitions. So that made it a lot easier. Yeah, just 36 sports. Just 36. <laughs> of all time. So that we'll crazy. go through. We'll go through every team for 36 oh, sports. Amazing. Right. Amazing. And in the book, what, the other question that, that you asked was about cohesiveness, which is obviously the team working together, and whether that was a thing that, causes teams like a like a Boston Celtics to be successful or is it a byproduct of it in that if you are successful then you will be cohesive and you sort of put that as a premise at the beginning of the book and it it sort of didn't get answered completely um but I'd, I'd sort of love to hear your answer to that question yeah you're right I never circled back on that point it you know it was interesting because I I spent a lot of time in baseball in the U.S. and I got to know a lot of the general managers, many of whom were very quantitatively minded and were, you know, really using numbers to some other teams. And this was the, the big thing in the 2000s. And, you know, they would always say, oh, team chemistry, whatever. If you win, you'll have great team chemistry. Um, and their theory was that you know, it was really about putting together the right combination of players. And then once you did that and if their skills overlapped and started winning, then they would have that cohesiveness. And really, I found that the exact opposite was true. It was it, it all comes from that cohesiveness. And it has to be something that's there. And it has to be something that gets built. Um, and it, it's something that I found really coalesces around one person. And it's the leader of the players more than anyone uh, who sets that tone. So, you know, cohesiveness, too, it's it's funny, like, this, this term, this team chemistry, this term that gets thrown a lot, around a lot. I just wasn't sure what that really meant. And I realized I had an idea of what I thought it was, but I didn't really know what it meant or how it exactly worked. And it's not just everyone loving each other. You know, that's, yeah. that's not it. I mean, a lot of the great teams that I found had a lot of conflict and internal conflicts and um, periods of, of where there was a lot of dissent and a lot of disagreement and they weren't necessarily all friends. Yep. So I realized that it was something else um, and that it was much more uh, textured and, and complex than I realized. So, um, I think I cracked the code in the end, but, uh, yeah. but it was very confusing because I, I realized over and over as I wrote this book that all of my assumptions 
really all of my assumptions about teams were wrong. Right. And I think that's the case, though. I think that's what it is. I mean, what this book does, the depth that it goes to, is you, you get into places that just aren't considered. People have this idea that they know what a team is. I've, I go to work every day with a group of people, and sure, we're a team. So that's what it is. Um, but they, it's fair to say they've never thought it about it at those depths. I mean, even if you just ask them to define it like you just did, or are we going to be successful and get along, or are we going to get along and then be successful? Those questions never get asked. So... To have someone go into it, the depth you have, I think is it does a great service for anyone who's genuinely interested in this sort of stuff. Well, I appreciate that. I mean, the, the one of the things that really um, that kind of got me curious was that I I spent a lot of teams a uh, time in my career with a, a lot of elite teams. I mean, my job was such that I would kind of parachute into big events to cover them, and I would see these elite teams at the height of their power, and I. I really had a sense that I, I, I kind of felt like I knew what what they were like. They were all somewhat similar, you know, and, and I felt mm-hmm. like I had, there was a, something of a pattern on those elite teams. But, you know, what I realized, you know, and what spurred me to, to start this project was that I realized that I'd, I'd seen their misfinished products and I'd never seen the moment where they made the transition to greatness. And that was something I didn't understand and, and uh, I'd never seen and I didn't know anything about. And so that was kind of the, the starting point for me. And, you know, one of the, the funny things about, about these teams is that, um, you know, they, they, they surprised me. I mean, I, I would listen to these championship teams and these players in, in their post game celebrations after they'd won a championship. And I would always listen very closely to what they said, because someone would always say, why is this team so great? And, what is it? And they always said the same things and they just sounded like cliches. I mean, well, we're a family, you know, and yeah. well, we have a great coach and well, we all bought in or we all take it one week at a time. Yeah. Right. We <laughs> yeah, took it yeah. one week at a time and you know, we, uh, and, and it was just, they would, you would see it in their faces. They would just sort of lapse into these cliches that they've heard other people say. And, um, I realized at that point, nobody knows. And, and even if you're in the middle of it, especially if you're in the middle of it, I think, um, oftentimes the people that are, 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 they're so wrapped up in the moment, they don't really understand mm. why the team was successful. And, and I realized that no one had really tried to study this in an objective way. So that, um, that yeah. was one of the things that pushed me into this subject. And you're talking about teams at the elite sporting levels. I mean, you, yes. you, you take that down to, to, to average corporate world um and, and small business and and people are, are again not through no real fault of their own they've got even less of a clue about it because they don't even have the success to go with it so it's it's just all a grind well there's another side to it too i think that there's another um thing that's emerging now and i think it comes from the um silicon valley sort of startup culture and uh, i think it's that it's had a real effect on on a lot of ideas about leadership and management and I think the problem is that a lot of those companies that we all uh, look to for um, a sense of where we're headed, uh, if you look at their growth trajectory, and it's just a straight arrow going straight up, and they've never really had um, any real serious hiccups along the way. And what, what I noticed about these elite teams is that they won for so long. I mean, one of the mm-hmm. one of the criteria that I put in place was that they had to have been dominant for at least four years for me to consider them because I, I really wanted to look at sustained greatness. I didn't want to look at these teams that may have had one incredible season or two. I really wanted to find teams that had won for long enough that you can assume that they had some bad luck and, yep. and that they had some tough moments. And um, sports is such a competitive environment, such a great laboratory for looking at teams because um, you know, the, the margin between winning and losing is so narrow. I mean, it's an inch in some cases, or it's one person's dumb mistake or mental error that can, that can end a, a streak like this. And sure. so sports is a great place to look at this. And, and what I realized was that, um, you know, the, the margins were so small and, uh, really that, that, this was the perfect place to look. And, and then I wanted to look at those teams that had sustained it. And what I found about the teams that sustained it was that all of them almost lost. And, uh, you know, teams, even teams that won 10 consecutive titles or nine consecutive titles, there was always one point at which it almost went away. Yeah, And it's inevitable. And that's, that was really instructive to me because 
I think that when leadership really matters and when um, whatever it is that makes a team strong really shows itself is in those tough moments. Mm. Um, I think that's when you really um, see what you're made of and you really see what it is about your chemistry and your team structure that, um, that that's really important and that's really unique and strong. And over and over, I found that uh, in every case, you know, the captain of this team, the leader of the team was the person who used – one of these traits, one of these quirks of personality, one of these um, philosophies to pull them through. And those are the moments I tried to, to highlight in the book. Sure, sure. And you, you mentioned before this, this the seven characteristics. Out of those seven, was there any one that was more dominant than the other? Or was it you have to have exactly all seven of these things? You can't just sort of be strong in one area and, and weak in the others. It, it, it really is. A, a, it's got to be across the board. It's across the board. I mean, what was interesting was that you know, depending on the sport and what's required, I think some of the characteristics were stronger than others. I mm. mean, in the very aggressive contact sports, um, there were definitely uh, uh, things like this um, nonverbal communication and toughness and effort that uh, really mattered more. And then in some of the sports that are not contact sports but are more strategic or mental, then – communication was so important. Um, yeah. the, the communication style of these captains was the thing that predominated. So, um, all of these people, I mean, you know, some of the, they didn't express every single one of these characteristics, but they had them and you could see in yeah. ways in which they had them. They didn't necessarily make a difference, um, uh, in the sport they played as much as others. But, uh, I don't really think there was any one that, um, was more important. In fact, you know, I look at them and, and I can, show you instances in the histories of these teams where each one of those characteristics was the one thing that helped this team preserve its dynasty. Yeah. So it was having the capacity to demonstrate that quality. Yes. It was really what, it. What the right. Yeah. yeah. Right. When you need it at the right time. Absolutely. Now, one other question that came up when I was reading this was this old argument. I could imagine with journalists hanging around sporting events that have come up all the time which is comp comparing players or teams from different eras. It's a bit of an aside from the book, but you know, you get that argument like oh, the, the, 90, oh, the 96 Bulls versus yeah. the 2016 Warriors and the win the most winning season. I mean, how do you, how do you actually compare those teams? And I'm one, I'm, I was sort of thinking, I wonder if Sam knows, has he got a, has he got a way that he would answer that <laughs> argument? I have had so many debates about this since the book came out and, and, you know, before that, and it's an age old question. And I don't think there's any doubt that the modern teams would destroy the older teams. Yeah. Um, but I think it's the nature of everything to evolve and, mm. and to improve. And I mean, it's, it's, uh, you know, there are a lot of scientific theories about this. I mean, everything kind of evolves and, and improves in a way. And, and so I don't really think it mattered in the end. And I spent a lot of time thinking about this, but the thing that really, uh, the, the point that really carried me along was that I realized when I was looking at the Boston Celtics and the Boston Celtics won, you know, 11 NBA titles in 13 years. And that's right. just phenomenal. I mean, I've, yeah. there's no team I found that, that accomplished something like that. So, yep. uh, that team, you know, I looked at them and I, I just, at one point thought to myself, can you imagine this team had won 10 NBA titles and they were still hungry enough to win an 11? Mm. You know, and that's the thing, you know, because the margins are so small in sports, I realized that it doesn't really matter, you know, the talent level or the tactics or the ability. Um, what really matters, I mean, any team in its context is going to face those moments where everything could go away. And um, there's no such thing as having such overwhelming talent that you're going to win everything. It's impossible. I mean, even the best teams lose sometimes. Yep. Uh, because that's the nature of sports. And that's why we love it so much. So, you know, I, I think that all of this talk about comparing different teams, I mean, ice hockey was one of the tough ones because uh, the Montreal Canadiens uh, from the 1950s that I included as one of the 16, everybody makes the point to me, well, there were only six teams in the NHL at the time. And how can you possibly compare that to the modern NHL, which has 30 teams? It's so much harder to win. Yeah. You know, and, and first of all, you know, if you look at it and you look at the NBA and the NHL, there's really only a few good teams hmm. because the talent's so dispersed. And, and this year, the NBA, I think there were really only three teams that had a chance to win the title. And uh, the talent's more dispersed. Back then, the talent was much more concentrated. The teams stayed together much longer. 
Uh, they had much more depth. And as a result, I, my argument would be that I think the average team was much harder to beat uh, back then. So yeah. there may have been fewer opponents to go through in order to win a title. But, you know, I don't think that it was any easier. And I think the same uh, dynamics that make a team strong uh, travel through time. And that's what my yeah. research showed. I mean, it's the same chemistry and the same formula that wins and creates dynasties no matter what time you're you're in and i think that sort of supersedes um you know just how talented or athletic or um uh, right. clever that's right uh, so so what you're saying is that the, it's the characteristics that that travel through time not the talents or the skills that people have got it's the attitude and the and these captains keep coming up with these same qualities it's not that it's a completely different game watching a, a boston celtics from back then as as opposed to a, a warriors from these days right and it's totally different i mean it's really kind of funny to watch the old nba clips because yeah. You just see the level of athletic ability is not the same. <laughs> yeah, it's not but, LeBron you know, running down the court. <laughs> you no, know, you know, I mean, then you watch LeBron James, and we're so accustomed to to things that that man does and how fast he is, and you don't how large it's just freakish. But yeah. you know, that's that's one of the things that I think keeps us coming back is that we keep seeing these things we've never seen before. But um, but really, look, I mean, teams are teams. And it's not sure. just in sports. I think it's everywhere. And I think that they, there are really fundamental characteristics that, um, that matter. And it matters a lot more than um, – and, and, it's, and it's always the same no matter what the context. And I think um, – you know, right. I think so I just set that argument aside. And it's a fun argument to have. Um, but I think if the, the subject is really what makes teams uh, transition into being – uh, extraordinary i think i couldn't agree more that's why I'd, I'd rather talk about this than try and argue argue the point to death and and get nowhere um one of the one of the questions i had was also about the captains that that you've come up with and obviously they they exist in these teams and these are the greatest teams but uh, did you come up with aspects and areas i mean names that come to mind where where those, the captains do exist these people do exist in other teams that maybe haven't made tier one of the list i mean you're looking at and and it's it, it'd probably be interesting i mean it, tier two team like a, the Chicago Bulls, Michael Jordan, who always you think leader and he's like the ultimate pin-up leader person. But another one I was thinking was maybe a John Elway um, in terms of what he brought to the to the Broncos. And just uh, do they exhibit those same sort of qualities? It's, it's sort of the people do exist. Maybe they don't have the same record. Right. No, I think there are a lot of people out there who have these characteristics who um, don't have all the other pieces that you need. And, you know, I think to be clear, you know, I, I, I thought when I started this process, I, I really didn't set out to write a book about leadership. I mm. never imagined that I would stumble into <laughs> these captains. I, yep. you know, I thought, I thought it was talent. You know, I thought talent would be the major force. I thought coaching would be uh, close on its heels. And I right. thought um, tactics, uh, money too. I thought, you know, resources would play a role. Mm. So all those things, you know, one by one, I examined and really found that none of them, I mean, not at all, uh, were constant across the, across all of these teams. I mean, mm. there were teams there, the Celtics being an example, uh, that had substandard talent by every possible measure, never had elite talent. And yet, you know, were had the best record in the history of their sport. And and there were teams that had lousy coach coaches that were lousy before their streaks began, or they even had two different coaches during the streak, or, you know, like the Brazilian mm. uh football team from uh the late fifties and sixties, their coach was Vicente Fiola, who was famous for falling asleep on the bench, <laughs> you know, and letting the players run practice and do everything. And I mean he was a uh, a great coach, but he wasn't running that team. Yeah, and it wasn't and, up to him. Yeah. No. And, yeah. you know, I saw this. It was shocking to me. So most of these coaches had little to no experience or, or mediocre records before these streaks of dominance began. And I just can't believe that they just suddenly woke up one morning and were geniuses. Yeah. Um, you know, obviously, there was more to it. But, you know, all those factors, I, that said – you know, I, I, I do think that in order to have this kind of elite success, you have to have a lot of things working in your favor. You need a good coach. You need talent. You need um, a good strategy sometimes. I mean, you need some combination. But the only constant of all these teams was that their streaks of dominance corresponded precisely, in some cases within two weeks, 
uh, of the arrival and departure of one player, and it was always the captain. Yep. In every single case, uncannily so. And if you look at Tier 2, it's the same pattern. I mean, the, the best teams in Tier 2 all had the same thing, and, and it was always the same kind of figure. And it's one of the reasons I think I spent so much time on this was I felt like I had stumbled into something um, that – blew me away. I mean, never would have imagined it. And I felt like it was important and, yeah. you know, something that I really felt a, a responsibility to, to tell the story that I felt the responsibility to tell well. And yep, definitely. Not. And I think that, and the other thing is we're talking through this and you just sort of went through the coach sort of theory. It, it's yeah. different to you, you, you term it leadership theory. And what you're talking about that I want to be clear is that it, you're not talking about leadership theory here. Um, you sort of, you don't disprove that leadership theory is important, but at the same time, you sort of challenge that idea in terms of the types of leaders that these people were. Right. Yeah, no, leadership theory, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting because I think there's a tendency to, um, uh, in a lot of theories of, of transformational leadership, for example, I mean, I, I think the point is right, and I think the effect that these kinds of leaders have on people is real, and we've seen it time and again, but you know, I think a lot of times the the characteristics that we ascribe to these people, um, I think it's kind of a grab bag. I mean, I think we throw in a lot of uh, a lot of good qualities, and I don't think that we're really necessarily distinguishing between which ones were really important and which ones weren't. And um, what I found with these with these captains was they were nothing, nothing like what I thought. And beyond that, they were they actually had characteristics and personality traits that I would have thought would disqualify someone from being a leader. <laughs> right. uh, really? I mean, I, I, it was, it was crazy. I mean, they, most of them were not even great talents. They were never, I mean, a few of them, but most of them were not superstars. Yep. They were role players and they, you know, played in unglamorous, you know, defensive positions and, and you know, on teams that had far better athletes and more famous athletes. Mm. Um, and they really shunned the spotlight. They were not charismatic in the least. And they really weren't um, uh, great, articulate uh, people. They didn't have that sort of – some of them did, but most of them didn't have that presence that you would associate with leadership. And the other things that were amazing, I mean they didn't give speeches. And this was just mystifying to me. None of them liked to give the big speech. And you know, they talked a lot inside the context of the team but in a very kind of democratic way – to individuals and and they listened as much as they spoke and created sort of try to create sort of a talkative culture and i never would have thought of that as a leadership trait and the other things that were totally counterintuitive to me were uh how often they introduced conflict into their teams mm. i mean they really pushed back on anything anything big or small that they thought was getting in the way of the team uh the team's ability to win and they could be really hard to manage yep uh and that was surprising. The other thing that, that, you know, took me a long time to puzzle out was that they often did unsportsmanlike things in competition and right. broke the rules, pushed the rules to the absolute breaking point. Um, and that was just something I would have immediately thought that would disqualify someone from leadership. But, you know, what I realized was that, you know, this was a tactic, a, a, a tool they used mm. consciously in order to help their teams win. And, they were off the field, though. They didn't subscribe to that. I mean, they were totally law-abiding and homebodies, almost introverts, many of them, and right. never got into trouble, never did anything aggressive, never broke the rules of, of polite society. They uh, they didn't get in bar brawls. They didn't get arrested. They didn't do some of the things that athletes do. They um, they really limited it to the field, and the, the motivation was to help the team win, which was their motivation for absolutely everything they did. Yeah. Uh, so all these things took a long time to unravel. But really, if you'd asked me to build a captain in a laboratory and gave me, you know, Dr. Frankenstein's playbook, I, I would have picked someone completely different. And I think it's important, though. I mean, what you just said there, there's something in that. I mean, these guys understand cl conflict. Do you know what I mean? They're not, they're not, right. they, they, they engage in it, but it's not a reaction to conflict. I, I would dare say that they sort of, they understand conflict explicitly and how to use it both ways. Therefore, they can switch it off when they're walking down the street, and then when they need to use it, they'll turn it on at full volume when they're, when they're either on the field or sure. dealing with a certain situation. I think there's a big difference between saying, yes, they, were, they engaged in conflict and they really understood how to use it. 
which which every team can benefit from if they really do understand the role that conflict has to play. That's so important, and I'm glad you said that because it's something that's so misunderstood, and it's I think less misunderstood, strangely, in business than it is in sports. I think mm-hmm. in business there's a lot of talk about red teaming, and um, you know there's so there's a, a the idea of avoiding groupthink. I mean there is some. Uh, a history of trying to bring conflict and dissent into a group in order to make sure that to road test its, its work and its decisions. But in sports, it's totally the opposite. I and mean, most people who run sports right. teams, if any player introduces conflict, they really want to get rid of them. They just want to ship them out because they think any conflict inside a team that has to perform together the way sports teams do is automatically toxic. And that's what I believed. I thought that People that introduced conflict were, were bad for teams. But, you know, this was one of the big revelations to me because I spent a lot of time reading and looking at um, uh, academic research on, on the subject of conflict inside teams. And I finally figured it out. And it's a theory that's kind of evolved in the last 10 or 15 years about conflict. Most um, people really thought conflict in, inside groups was generally a negative thing. But mm. uh, what they discovered was that really there are two types of conflict. Uh, there are several types, in fact, but really there are two types that mattered in sports. And one is personal conflict. And this is when you're driven by animosity. You just don't like somebody and you, uh, you, know, you, you get into an argument or a, a disagreement that's really driven by dislike. And this is always toxic. And I think it's toxic in sports teams as well. Mm. But there's another type of conflict which is described as task conflict. And task conflict is an argument about the way the team is going about its business. And when I read that, it's just like a light went on because in all the instances of conflict that I saw with these captains, um, it wasn't personal. And they made a point that it wasn't personal. It was always about how the team was uh, doing its work or, or it, was, it was about keeping the team unified. It was always about the collective and never about any kind of personal dislike. And that just explained it perfectly. And you know, one of my favorite examples was – Philip Lahm, who was the captain of this great uh, German soccer team that won the World Cup and uh, and was also the captain of Bayern Munich during a really great run that they had. And, you know, he did this famous thing in 2008, I think, or 2009, where the team had spent all this money on new players and, and just threw all these people in the field that were all stars and with no sense of strategy or how they should play together. And Lam was a very tactical captain, very humble, very quiet, but had a real backbone. And so he tried to tell the board of directors that runs Bayern that they needed a strategy. He wanted to talk to them about this. He made some comments on TV and the board invited him in Mm -hmm. and uh, he they just told him to, to shut up and stop criticizing the team on TV. So <laughs> yep. Lom realized they didn't want to hear from him. So what he did was in this in Europe, this is unheard of. He called a reporter and sat down and gave an interview to a Munich paper where he blasted the, their strategy. And, mm-hmm. you know, this was unheard of. And he was, you know, fined the largest fine in the history of the team. It was outrageous. It was the talk of, of European soccer that someone would do something like this because it had never been done. Right. But when I had that interview translated and read, um, read it closely, he made a point to say this wasn't personal and he thought that everyone on the team and the management of the team and the coach had the right ability and that they could get the job done. It was just a matter of tactics. And that's when it kind of dawned on me that that was task conflict. It wasn't personal. And that's the secret. If you're going to create conflict inside a team, it has to be about doing the work and the work better. And, and, and it can't be driven by any sort of animosity. And that, that was a real lesson for me, it's something I'd never considered. Oh, it's so, it's so important. I mean, the way we look at it and the way we teach it um, to our clients and our, the people we deal with, I always ask the question, would you rather have artificial harmony or would you rather engage in healthy conflict? Right. And it's sort of, which one do you want to pick? Because you can have either one, but there's going to be consequences. And as long as you keep it not personal, I mean, if you can't have conflict, then where do you get the genuine buy-in to a decision? Like, if you don't agree with me, we've got to have a conversation. We've got to have that, not necessarily have it out personally, but we've got to get to the depth of what it is that we disagree on and resolve that conflict. Otherwise, we're not going to move on. Or if we do, one of us is probably going to go at at a suboptimal sort of effort level. It's so true. And, and one of the things that I've, I've heard from people who've read the book is that 
you know, it's certainly true of me too, but they've reassessed a lot of the teams they've been on after, yeah. <laughs> after reading it. And, you know, I, I did the same thing and I thought, I thought about the teams or the groups I've been in that I thought were really fun and that I remember fondly, you know, and, and I think the ones that had that sort of, uh, harmony weren't that great really, mm. you know, but the ones that I felt like really stood out and achieved impressive things. I, I do remember there being a lot more conflict, a lot more, uh, discussion. And, and I remember the process being a lot more difficult. And, yep. uh, that, that, I think that's, again, I think we have all these myths that we, um, I certainly had about how a, a team is supposed to operate, especially a team that performs together under intense pressure. And, um, you know, I think it's really hurting. It's hurting. It's hurting business. It's hurting sports. It's, it's, oh, um, everywhere. It's also keeping a lot of people who have great leadership qualities away from leadership, which I think is a shame. That's right. I couldn't agree more. So you just said that if you're in a lab before you wrote the book, that it'd be a completely different sort of, um, Frankenstein that you would have brought out of the lab in terms of a captain. What about now? I mean, the book is great. And and I, as I was reading, I'm thinking, okay, this is fantastic. We've got a blueprint for historically what has worked. Um, and and it is brand new in, in terms of looking at it this way. But if you were going to go into a, a place where you said, okay, I'm going to sit down, I'm going to try and create the most successful team, be it in sport, uh, business, wherever it might be, how would you go about that now with what you do know? If you were going to try and create a, a tier one team, what would what would the way you'd go about that? Yeah, no, I have a complete – I've thought this through and I have a complete step-by-step -step sense of what I would do. And, you know, I've told – I've talked to some sports executives about this too and I think uh, some of them, to their credit, I mean, are, are already thinking along these lines. But I think the most important relationship on a team – uh, which never gets enough credit, especially in sports, but I think it's true of a lot of teams, is the relationship between the person who oversees the team, and this would be the coach in a sports environment, mm -hmm. uh, and the person who actually leads the team from inside, mm -hmm. which would be the captain. And you know what I've found, I spent a lot of time looking at coaching because I didn't understand um, how much coaches matter and, and when they when they do have a positive impact. And what I, I think this is a good lesson for executives too. What I found was that, uh, the, even the great, even the great coaches, um, Jock McHale of Collingwood is in my book and mm -hmm. Vince Lombardi and, and Bill Belichick and Alex Ferguson, um, all these great, uh, coaches and managers, they only achieved their greatest results when they had a captain like this working with them. But the thing about it that never gets, um, mentioned is that, in these cases, the coach, which would be the overseeing executive in a business context, you know, was able to give that captain a lot of independence. And that captain served as a classic middle manager, a liaison between the players and the employees and management. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were very independent. And, and what they would do is, you know, they were in this position where they understood what the coach wanted, the coach's vision, and they uh, understood what the player's could do and couldn't do and, and what they wanted to do, what would motivate them. And they understood the opposition they were against and the task at hand. And they would take all of those things and they would act independently. And in all of those cases, if you look at um, all of those coaches I mentioned, um, the, the captains that they had at their peaks were very independent minded and tactical and were empowered to make decisions on the field independent of the coach. Mm -hmm. And this, you know, would be something that we would think, well, you know, a coach, that's a sign of a, a coach not having control of the team. But really, it's the absolute key to um, creating a successful team. So right. the first thing I would do uh, is is to find a coach who understood that. And many of them do. Alex Ferguson, you know, absolutely believed that the minute he uh, – the, that the match began, he would just sit down in the dugout and fold his arms. And it was up to the captain to, to – make things happen. And right. I would find a coach who has that idea mm -hmm. and who is willing to um, do everything they can before competition, before um, uh, a team sets out on a project to uh, set the tone and, and get a sense of what's expected and what is necessary. And then uh, is able to sit back and allow that person that they've uh, have that partnership with to run the team. So yep. that's the number one thing. And I think that's the most important decision that a coach makes is who that person is and who they're partner is going to be. 
Yes. Uh, so that's the first thing I would, I would do. And, you know, the question that I get asked more than any other is how do you find these people? How do you identify them? Right? Mm. Like where do they come from? And, and it's hard. And that's the thing that I, I've given a lot of thought to. So, you know, the, 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 real, the first thing that's difficult is that we all think, well, you know, we're going to have a job interview, right? We're going to talk to this person. We're going to ask them tough questions. We're going to um, see what, what they're like and hear what they have to say. And this is absolutely the wrong way to find one of these people because they would not wow you in a job interview. They're not articulate or eloquent. And if you ask them, um, my advice would be that if you're trying to find a team lead like this, someone who has these characteristics, you know, get them in an interview and say, wow, this team you were on before, what an incredible achievement. You must be an amazing leader. Like you must have really been able to bring this team together. And right. if this person says, yeah, definitely. And I, you know, I really think that I did really, that's the wrong that's person. That's not the person. Yeah. You know, yeah. That makes sense. The person, the right captain would say, oh, well, you know, I had great teammates and, you know, I, and they would minimize their contributions because that's what yeah. all these captains did. And so that's one way. And then the real lesson I think is that you can't sit down one-on-one and and detect these qualities. The only way to see it is to watch the way that they interact with other people in a team setting. And, Mm. you know, if you can engineer some way to see that, I think you'll, you'll be able to tell because it's not the person who clinks their glass and gives the big speech and tries to set a tone and tries to, um, project leadership. It's the person who's quietly going around and talking to everyone individually with great enthusiasm and listening and, um, it's, it's, it's a quieter set of skills that you can only really see by watching. Yeah, and, and, and obviously having the same mindset yourself in terms of being aware of these qualities. I mean, if you, yes. you, you've yeah. got to have that awareness as the person at the top to be able to, to look for it. You can't look for something you don't even know exists. Right. It's sort of, yes, yes. Everyone looks for bright and shiny. Everyone thinks that talent and charisma, um, you know, are, are the things that really mark someone as a leader. They think that leaders should be exceptional in ways that are immediately obvious to everyone. And that is the number one mistake because, you know, the, the, the thing I, I keep saying, and it sounds crazy, but I think it's true. I think if you're looking for the captain or the team lead uh, among a group of people that are working together, I would really advise you to start with the least likely person. Mm. Yeah, work, work, your way out. work your way out. Least likely person to be tapped as the leader and start there. Yeah. Probably not the right person, but I think if you start there and work your way up, you're going to get to the right answer faster than if you look for the person who seems to have all those classic leadership qualities and go down. And one of the ones, as you were talking, and the picture that comes into my mind in this, this sort of relationship, one that I, I sort of have in my head is, is the Tim Duncan, Coach Pop sort of relationship. Um, yes. for the Spurs. I mean, you look at those two, neither of them are, are media darlings, you'd have to say. Um, you don't see them a no. lot. Um, I mean, Tim Duncan's someone who I think is one of the ultimate team players. I'd love to be able to interview him. I, whether that would ever happen, who knows? He won't but, do it. Exactly. <laughs> do you know what I mean? It's sort of like, but yeah. you're the guy. This is what I need. And then it's sort of like, I, don't, I might just have a podcast of silence and just go, this is Tim Duncan. <laughs> yeah. But he's boring. Like the thing is, he wouldn't have anything interesting to say. I mean, you know, he doesn't really shine in those sorts of environments. Yeah, uh, so. That's right. It's sort of like that, and it just proves what we're sort of talking about here. It's sort of like these aren't the guys that you need to do. So, lucky people like you write these sort of books. Otherwise, I'd, I'd be I'd be struggling to find some of these people to actually get them on. Well, it was the hardest thing about this book was you can imagine I'm I'm I find these captains who are publicity averse and don't want to be singled out and. You can imagine how hard it was to convince them to talk to oh. me, the ones who would. I mean, some of them wouldn't. You know, some of them had Jack Lambert of the Pittsburgh Steelers, who's probably the, the person I would want to talk to the most. That He just doesn't – he's done two interviews in the last 25 years. Wow. He doesn't even go back to the stadium when they honor his <laughs> former teams. He yeah. said his, his – in one interview, he said his children hadn't even been to, to a Steelers game. And they're, Isn't- you know – that's just a, it's mind blowing. He wants nothing to do with it. He doesn't want anything to do with the accolades or any yeah. of it. He just doesn't care. That's incredible. I mean, and Sam, we could we could we could go through the whole list. I mean, I've got them here. We, we obviously don't have time, and you've got a lot of other people to talk to. Um, but listen, as I said, the book is just it's a fascinating book. Whether you love sports, you love statistics, you love 
business, whatever it is, there's something in there that you'll be able to draw out of these examples because they're just so rich and, and they're so so different. As we sort of said at the top, you've gone down the rabbit hole and just opened it up for everyone to to have a new view and a new way of looking at this stuff, which which hopefully they do because clearly it's what's it's what's needed at the moment. Well, thanks, Dan. I mean, it means a lot because I know that you live and breathe this stuff every day and you're always observing teams and you know it's it's great to hear that it resonates with you because uh, uh you know it was obviously a, a, a hard get yeah so I'm glad, it, I'm glad it resonates that's right that's right so before we get let you go though what we'll do um if you're up for it is ask sure. our barn raisers top 10 so the 10 quick questions that i get all our guests to answer at the end of each episode would you be up for that totally let's do it cool so question number one what is one thing you feel must be present or created for a team to succeed? Communication, a, a talkative, open culture where everybody can feel comfortable speaking. Fantastic. Number two, what is one thing you feel must be avoided or overcome in order for a team to succeed? Public perceptions, outside perceptions of uh, the team, of how the team works, of who the best contributors are in the team. I think Everyone who's outside the walls uh, and their op opinions of what a team is and what it's doing just have to be ignored. Right. Good or bad? Good or bad. Yes. Okay. Number three, what team, I, I can't wait for your answer to this. What team, current or historic, would you love to have been a member of? All of them, you know, every single <laughs> one. That is so many. I, I would have to say, though, if I really, really had to pick, I would be in Barcelona from 2008 to 13 and not just because they were such a dominant team and so much fun and had such an incredible chemistry and camaraderie and humility about them um, but it's Barcelona I mean it's a who would want to live there who would want to be a big celebrity in a you know place like that and and you know the fact that they did it in the modern era and that they did something no other team had ever done in terms of their accomplishments I I, I think I'd have to do that. I think I would just, um, I, I would just like to live in Barcelona too and go to the beach and, you know, be it, part of that incredible team. It sounds so. pretty good. They paid, they paid, yeah. paid pretty and decent paid wages, well. didn't they? <laughs> exactly. I forgot about that. Yeah, and the free, you know, I mean, I like get the free cars and everything else they got. So yeah, I take that. I think absolutely, and this one as well. I mean, this is when I wrote this question originally, and I, and I found your book. I thought this is just. This is made for made for you to answer this, which is who is an ultimate team player in your eyes and why? That's so hard. You know, I I, I would say, I mean, I would just I said Barcelona, and I probably would go to Carlos Puyol, who uh, was the captain of that team initially, because I, he's just such a great example of what I'm talking about. But since I already talked about Barcelona, I, I would go with Tim Duncan, and uh, you know, I think. One of the great refreshing things to me is I think he's finally getting a lot of credit for um, for what he did, but it's really incomparable. I mean, he has the personality, the affect in interviews of a vacuum cleaner. You know, he's yeah. just <laughs> he has no visible emotion, and no. you know, but this is this is underneath that. You know, I spent a lot of time watching him play and uh, observing him very closely and talking to teammates uh, as I wrote the book. And just the stories are amazing. I mean, he uh, – a few quick things. So he took pay cuts, you know, in order to allow the team to sign better players. And in yeah. his final season, he was probably making a third of what he could have made somewhere else. He uh, never – had. you talk about the relationship with Popovich and he never uh, – minded being dressed down and then Popovich would lay into him I think on purpose sometimes when new players were there to show that you know no one on that team was above um criticism and mm. you know the, the most amazing thing I, I'll just stop here because I could go on but I think the most no, amazing please, thing was I I spoke with um R.C. Buford who's the general manager of the Spurs after the book came out I sent him a copy and and, and we we talked a little bit about the findings and he um I said to him, you know, how do you think the team has managed to continue its successes here without Duncan? And he said, what do you mean without Duncan? <laughs> he said, he still comes to practice three times a week. Wow. You know, he's, he's retired. He's not being paid and he comes to practice and he still talks to the players about tough matchups and, you know, works with them and, and helps the team um, prepare for, for games. And that's, 
Can you imagine? Oh. He's retired and he's still coming and he's still playing that role and communicating with everyone and, and, uh, and helping out. And I just, I think that's something I've never seen before. Oh, absolutely. He must have a depth of care within himself for, for people and, and the people he works with is, would just be phenomenal to, to witness up close and behind, behind the closed doors. Yeah. The way that he communicates, I mean, that that's, the, he, he want to know how to communicate with teammates, watched him Duncan because he doesn't, it's not emotional. He's not a rah-rah guy. He doesn't give speeches, but he talks very intensely to people one-on-one. Mm. He approaches everybody. And if you watch him, there's this great picture that I have of him staring into Tony Parker's eyes. He'll make eye contact for an uncomfortable amount of time, three, four <laughs> seconds. And yeah. to make his points, and he's a master of, of communicating his points, not just from what he says, but from his gestures and body language. And it's remarkable. Really oh, remarkable. Absolutely. Well, hopefully with that glowing praise, he's, he's listening and uh, yeah. he might just decide, you know what, I'm going to come on and tell everything. That'd be awesome. No, he's probably, he would probably be hiding under his, you know, on blankets. Like, shut up. I, that's embarrassing to him, that's, I'm sure. Exactly. Don't talk about me like that. <laughs> anyway, number five, what three qualities make someone a great teammate or colleague? Uh, I, I'd say humility, effort and commitment. And courage, the ability to to stand apart when it's in, when it's necessary and to take an unpopular stand. Mm. Yep, terrific. All right, number six. What three qualities make someone a great coach or manager? I will start again with humility because I think uh, it's completely underrated, especially in coaches. Um, but I'd say also transparency um, and vision. Vision being the third thing. I think humility and transparency and the way you communicate and make decisions are essential. And I think having a vision is crucially important, but I think some teams that I've studied seem to have succeeded even with coaches that weren't visionaries or tacticians in that way. So um, Mm -hmm. I do think it's very valuable, but um, a vision of the way things should be, but, um, but not completely necessary. Sure. Sure. Okay. Number seven, what is one thing that instantly makes you feel part of a team? I think it's being listened to and I think it's really underrated. And that's another thing I learned from Duncan and and others was how much they listen and especially to people that are new to the team and people have just come on. I think the idea um, of of being heard, especially when you're someone who's kind of new or the low person on the totem pole, that's one of the things teammates always said to me. Uh, mattered a great deal was that they felt like the captain, the leader heard them and wanted their input and listened. And I, and I think that's the, the first way to do it. Number eight, what's one thing that instantly makes you feel excluded from a team? Personal attacks and a hundred percent. I think, um, I think any kind of personal uh, affront um, is, is immediately um, going to create a toxic situation. I don't think it's fatal, but um, I think that's, I think even doing that makes you feel excluded from the team. I think making personal attacks also makes you feel excluded. So I think it works both ways. Sure. Number nine, what is your fondest team memory? Well, I made it the, the preface to the book because, um, uh, because it really was influential in my life, but I played on this little league baseball team when I was a kid. Uh, and it, you know, we weren't, the bad news bears. We weren't terrible. I mean, we were, uh, we were mediocre. We probably won half of our games sure. every year. And it was the same kids from the same neighborhood at year in and year out. And, uh, one year, I think I was 11 and, uh, we, I don't know what happened, but we were just a different team and we won and we won again and won again. And we finished the season undefeated and it was the most incredible experience I ever had in a team context because it's completely unexpected and different. And it just, you notice what happens on a great team. I mean, uh, suddenly people who, you know, would let balls roll between their legs in practice, we're making good plays or decent plays. And we always got the pitching we needed. We got the hit when we needed it. And it was as if we were um, kind of floating above ourselves almost. I mean, we weren't the same people and it was this, kind of euphoria that I'd never experienced. And sadly, you know, I thought that 
this was just something that happened on a team and this was a common occurrence. But again, I, it never happened to me again. Yep. You know, I never played on another team that was anywhere near that good. And, um, you know, even in, in when I was, you know, older playing recreational basketball, I was never on a great team like that. So that was really it. And I think that created this fascination in me. I just didn't understand why that kind of thing wow. happens, and how it happens. And I wanted to be around it. I think it's one of the reasons I wanted sports writing because I, I, I love being around teams like that. I just think there's something magical about them. Right, right. Well, I've only got one question to go, but I'm going to ask one in between here. Have you ever gone back and looked at that team, the, the, the baseball team, and tried to apply what you've learned now to that and figure out who was the, the captain of that team? Does it correlate yeah. even back there? No, I mean, memories are pretty hazy. I can't, I can't really remember. I know that we had um, uh, one of our pitchers kind of was had an was pretty early puberty and his fastball got a little bit better but, <laughs> but no i can't remember honestly i have no idea i always thought it was our coach who um you know but he but that was the only year we were any good so i i don't know i, I don't know what it was i can't remember the dynamics of that team enough to say but uh fair enough fair enough okay number 10 what is one thing you'd like to hear a coach manager boss or teammate say about you um relentless you know, I think that's that's probably the thing that uh, that I think. You know, I, I've tried to grade myself on all these characteristics, and I think it's <laughs> something other people have done. And you know, I, I don't I don't pass some of these characteristics at all. But you know, I do think that I relate really well to the doggedness, and I think you know that's something that I uh, that I think I do have in common with these captains is that ability to just keep going and working and playing through tough moments and, and continuing to, to work hard. And, and I think that's, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to boast. I just think that's the one characteristic I could, I really identify with, with these guys. So I'd love to hear someone say that about me. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if they would, <laughs> but, but that I'm just really happy if they did. Yeah, oh, fantastic. And as someone who's read the book, I could I could say that you are relentless because <laughs> there is not every question that you go to ask about it. You read something, you go, but what about this? And you answer that in sort of the next couple of pages or <laughs> later in the book. It, it, it is it is just relentless in terms of how you've pursued the, the topic and the people. So, uh, Sam, I, I, again, thank you for coming on and every success with the book. Um, I'd imagine there's one hell of a book tour you could do with all the teams that you've picked out from around the world. So uh, yeah. is that still going? Where, where about to you? Yeah, just, no, I was just in London. Uh, I was just in London and, and doing some work there. And, and you know, we're – in the process of selling the book in some other European countries. And I don't know if I'll need to travel there. Um, and you know, I'm hoping to make it out your way at some point. And, uh, Oh, that'd be great. That'd be great. I'd love to go back to Brazil too. I had such a great uh, time there and I met Carlos Alberto Torres, who was the captain of the 1970 Brazil team, which I think is probably the best single season team ever. And, uh, sadly he died about two months after I spoke with him. He had mm. a, a heart attack, but uh, I had such a great time there and learned so much about Brazil, which I, I everything I thought about Brazilian soccer was wrong. And I would, oh, really? <laughs> I would, I would love to go back and and, uh, and do some publicity there. So we'll wow. see if that happens. Fantastic. Well, as I said, thank you for making the time to talk to us. And uh, I can't wait to, to watch how this ripples out because I think it's, it's really, really worthwhile. Well, Dan, thank you so much. It's great questions. I really had a fun time. Wow. Did you enjoy that conversation? I don't know about you, but I could have listened to Sam speak about his work for a whole lot longer. Now, if you want to get your hands on Sam's book, The Captain Class, then there's a link in the show notes that'll take you to Amazon. And of course, you can get it wherever all good books are sold. I've been traveling a lot lately, and it's great to see the book actually being recommended and promoted in airport bookstores all over the world. So that's about it for this edition of Barn Raisers, and by now you should be getting to know how this ending goes. If you like that conversation, then you know what I'm going to ask. That's right. We'd really like it if you'd tell someone about it. And we'd love it if you'd take a moment to give us a review on iTunes. We've actually created a couple of videos that'll help you out to create your review in iTunes, and the links to those are in the show notes. So please check them out and give us a shout out. It would mean the world to us. Now, before I do go, I also want to clear up some minor changes to our scheduling. 
As mentioned a while ago, I'm still trying to find the right frequency for these podcasts, and I really do want to make sure I stick to the schedule. And to be honest, I'm probably not doing the best job of that so far. So, from this point forward, the conversation show, like today's Barn Raisers, is going to come out fortnightly. That's every two weeks, and it'll be on a Tuesday. In addition to this, depending on my travelling schedule, the live events that I do, and most importantly, the level of interest from you guys, the Team Huddle episode, the one that fits in the middle, is now going to be a bit more optional, or it might float around a little bit. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means that they might show up from time to time, but they're not going to be on a fixed schedule. But no matter when we do those Team Huddle episodes, we'll always let you know when they're released. Which brings me to my last point. How do you stay in touch with us? Well, that's the easy part. If you're on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram, you can simply follow us. The handle is at Pod. Once you're there, feel free to join in the conversation, send us your questions, share your comments, or anything else that you feel fits in with our Team First mission. You can also find everything you'd like to know about Barn Raisers, including links to all the episodes and the show notes, on our homepage, www.barnraiserspodcast.com. And finally, you can get in touch with me personally. That's right. I want to hear your thoughts, your suggestions, stories, and feedback. All you need to do is email me at dan at shiftingpeers.com. Well, that's about it from me now. I've been Dan Stones. This has been Barn Raisers. And until next time, remember, the best team players shine a little brighter in the darkness. Bye for now.